All right, welcome you guys. Today we're going to talk about the algebra functions. Honestly, this stuff isn't super hard. What is hard though is the notation. I remember I had algebra two when I was in high school and I had it sixth period and I played sports. And so I'd miss every now and then because of a game. And I think I missed when they explained this notation. And so I was just terrible at this because the notation. You know, it looks like you're multiplying when you're not and stuff like that. And so it just really got to me. So I'm going to really harp on the notation and make a big deal out of it. Because if you can understand the notation, the math isn't hard at all. Okay. So this front, this first slide is just basically telling you, like, this is our shorthand way of writing this. So every time I do a problem, I will take it from the shorthand and make it the longer. But we like to do things efficiently in math. I think most places people like to do things efficiently. So you see how right here I'm only writing X once, whereas over here I'm writing it twice. So this would be more efficient because I don't have to write the X twice. You can kind of think of it as like the X distributing in, but then I think people think you're multiplying when you're really not. Um, but essentially the X is going to show up twice, even though we only write it once. And that's true of all of these. This is our efficient way of writing F of X minus G of X. I don't have to write the X twice when I write it like this. This is our efficient way of writing f of x times g of x. And similarly, I only write the x once here, but really the x goes with both. It's f of x over g of x, provided that the denominator is not zero. We know no denominators can be zero. We can't be dividing by zero in math. All right, so let's try um, a few of these. So the first few start off with, um, with numbers, right? Okay, so let's go ahead. Now this looks like, F times negative three, you guys. That's what it looks like. So the first thing that I want to point out is this does not mean multiply. So I'm going to write that down. Doesn't mean multiply. Okay, I'm just going to put a little arrow right here. That was the hardest thing for me. I was thinking, oh, I need to multiply here. Okay, we don't. So what this means, oh, I hate when it does that. So what this means is it means that you need to substitute the negative three in. Okay, so let me just kind of write that. So it doesn't mean multiply. Sorry, I accidentally erased a little bit too much. Plug, or I'm just gonna put plug because I'm lazy and I don't wanna write out the long word substitute. Plug negative three in for X. Okay, so you're basically going to be taking the negative three and you're going to be substituting it in here. Oops, it just disappeared on me. Try this again. In here and here. Oh no. Let's try this again. There's some board glitching going on. There we go. Now we're good. Okay. All right. And then we know that we're plugging it into this function because this is f of x. And that's why the f is there. It's saying here's the function. And here's the number that you're going to put in for x. So here we go. So we're going to put in negative 3 squared minus 3 times negative 3 plus 1. OK. All right, so negative 3 times negative 3 is 9. And again, negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. So it looks like we're just going to get 18 plus 1. So it looks like we're just going to get 19. So the conclusion is that f of negative 3 is 19. OK, part b. So this time we're going to be substituting negative 4 or 4 in for the x, right? So plug in 4 for x. And we're going to be doing it in the function g this time. So we're going to substitute the 4 in right there. So we've got the square root of 8 take away 4, which is the square root of 4, which gets us 2. So g of 4 equals 2. Okay. Not too bad if you understand what the notation means. Now, this one can really get to people because it's got letters, variables in it, but it's the same thing. We know that we take whatever's inside the parentheses and that we're going to plug it in for x. So we're going to be taking a plus 1 
and we're going to substitute it in here and here. So that's going to give us a plus 1 squared minus 3 times a plus 1 plus 1. All right. So now it's just a matter of like, don't make any mistakes, right? A plus 1 squared, a lot of students will just square each piece. Nah, you got to write it out twice, you guys. The number one mistake I see, sorry, I can't write an A today. The number one mistake I see is people will just do this. They'll be like, okay, A squared and 1 is squared. And they'll just write that. And that would be incorrect, okay? We're going to get a little more than that. All right, now let's go ahead and distribute the negative 3 to the A and to the 1. And then we got to foil this guy out. So let's see, we get a squared. One times a is just a. One times a is just a. One times one is one. And you know what? I might as well combine these guys while I'm at it. So they're going to make negative four or negative two. Okay. All right. So we got to go from highest exponent to lowest. So I'm going to put the a squared first. So I've taken care of that. And then I'm going to combine all the a's, right? So let's see here. We've got a plus a and then negative 3a. So a plus a is 2a. 2a take away 3 would be negative a. And then we'll combine all the constants. So we'll go ahead and take positive 1 and negative 2. So 1 minus 2, that's going to be negative 1. All right. Now, another mistake students make is they go too far. They'll look at this and they'll be like, oh, you know what? I should like factor this or use the quadratic and solve it. This is done. This is what the answer to f of a plus one is. In general, if you don't see an equal zero and you cannot add your own equal zero, okay? If you don't see an equal zero, then don't solve it, okay? It's gotta be equal or to a number, I guess. But um, so stop while you're ahead, quit while you're ahead. Okay, I'm just going to look at this really quickly, make sure the math all looks good. Yeah, okay. All right, moving on. So this next one, we're going to be substituting 10 in for x in the function g. So that's going to give us the square root of 8 minus 10. That ends up giving us an imaginary number, right? So the whole part where it says, if possible, up here in the directions, right? This is actually not possible because 10 is not in the domain. OK, so I'm going to write this down. g of 10 is not defined since 10 is not in the domain of g. Now, you could see that from the math we did here. If you end up getting an imaginary, then it's going to not be in the domain. But you might recall earlier in one of our earlier lessons that when we have radicals, we take the stuff that's underneath the radical. So in this case, you would take the 8 minus x, and you set it greater than or equal to 0, because that's your way of saying, I'm not going to be square rooting negatives. OK, and then you solve that. I would probably just add the x over. That's how I would solve it. And these cancel. 8 is greater than x, or greater than or equal to x, or x is less than or equal to 8. So the only numbers that would be on this graph have to be numbers going this way. And notice, 10 is not a part of that, right? And it's even cooler if you go and you look at the graph. This is the square root of 8 minus 10, right? So let me type that in. I mean, what am I talking about? 8 minus x. All right, so square root 8 minus x. So what you'll notice is exactly what we just said. Let me hide this, OK? It's only when we're less than 8. It only goes this way. Over here at 10, there's no function value, which explains why you know, we uh, ended up getting an imaginary for that. G of 10 is not defined since 10 is not in the domain of G. All right. So hopefully that helps explain that strange case. All right. Let me go back and see if I move this higher. Oops. If I can get that X back. Got hidden somehow. 
There it is. Okay. All right. So now we're starting to use some of the, the new stuff that we just learned on that front page. The negative eight really goes with both. You know, we don't want to write it twice. We get a little lazy, but really the negative eight goes with both of these. I just want to write below it what you saw on that first slide so you can compare the two. That's what was on the first slide. And you can see we applied it, but we just applied it with a negative eight, okay? All right, so what we're gonna do, let me go down here on this line. We have to substitute eight in for the X's here, right? And then we have, or negative eight, and we have to substitute negative eight in here. Okay, so here's how I think I'm gonna attack this. Let's find them both individually. So let's find, um, I'll do it down here. Let's find F of negative eight. So I'm substituting it in right now. And then we'll do the math. So negative eight times negative eight is positive 64. Negative three times negative eight is positive 24. And if we add that all up, I think we're gonna get 89, you guys. Okay. All right. So for this whole F of eight, we got 89. Now minus, let's go and figure out G of negative eight. All right. So we're going to substitute negative eight in. So minus negative eight. Minus a negative means plus. So we're square rooting 16. Cool. Looks like the answer is going to be four. So minus four. All right, 89 minus four gets us 85 as our answer. All right, so that was our first one. The hardest part is just knowing that this is this. Other than that, you know how to find f of negative eight. Plug in negative eight for the x's in the function f. For g of negative eight, plug in negative eight for the x in the function g. All right, let's do it again, but let's do multiplication this time. So this is the shorthand notation for g of zero times h of zero. So down here at the bottom, let's go ahead and figure out what g of zero is. So that means we're gonna be substituting the zero in right there. So it's gonna be the square root of eight minus zero, root eight. Now, to break down the root eight, there's lots of different ways, right? You could say, um, you break it down with prime factorization. Doubles go on the outside. Singles go on the inside. That'd be one way. Or you could say, all right, well, eight has a perfect square inside of it. It has a four inside of it. Eight is four times two. Well, let's actually root the four. And there's your two, root two. And those of you who are working with the recommended calculator for the class, right, then you would just type this in and it automatically breaks it down for you. That is not something all calculators do, you guys. So that is a very nice function. All right, and then the last one that we're gonna get, I'm gonna do it in a different color just because we need F of, or H of zero, just kidding. Looking right here. So the zero has to get substituted into the function H. So it's gonna be two over zero plus one, so two over one. Well, two divided by one is just two. So H of zero, boy, that's pretty ugly. Let me rewrite that. There we go. All right, so H of zero is two. So let's go back to our problem. Let's go substitute these things in. So G of zero, two root two, dot H of zero is two. So when we multiply the integers by each other, right? These two, I should probably put it right here. Two times two is gonna get us four and we'll just bring the root two along. There's our answer. Okay. So pretty simple if you can get to this first spot and then that just means plug in zero into the G, the function G. 
And this one means plug in zero into the function h. And you'll just multiply those two things when you get done. All right, h of negative 1. So we're going to substitute in negative 1 and for the x in the function h. So that's going to get us this. Now again, we can't divide by 0. So this is actually undefined. So let's just remind ourselves we cannot divide by 0. I'll write that right here. Uh, all right. So again, it's going to be the same thing that we wrote earlier of that um, zero is not, or negative one is not in the domain of this function, okay? So h of negative one is undefined since negative one is not in the domain of h. So last time it was a radical. Radicals, they have to be greater than or equal to zero. Remember, we take the denominators of functions and we set them equal to zero to get their domain. And this is what it can't be, right? The bottom of a fraction cannot be zero. And so you're saying, here's the bottom of the fraction. It cannot be zero. You subtract one from both sides, then you get that x cannot be negative one. So on a number line, here's negative one. That's not allowed, but everything this way is and everything this way is. So the domain for h oops, would be from negative infinity all the way up to negative one, not included. And then that's that's describing this side, right? And then from negative one to infinity, again, put parentheses so you don't include negative one. So there's our domain, okay? And you'll see that when I do the graph, two over x plus one. Let's delete this guy out. Two divided by x plus one. So you'll notice at negative one, there's a big gaping, you know, like kind of, I don't want to say hole because that means something different, but there's a gap in the graph. It's discontinuous there, okay? There is no function value for negative one. And that's why we ended up getting undefined, okay? All right. Again, this if possible, huh? That's really coming into play. Not every time we plug in a number, are we going to get a value out? Okay. So let's just read through this little blurb because it's kind of, it's important. We're going to use it on the next couple of examples. So whether we're adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing, if f and g are functions, then the domain of f plus, f minus, and f times is the intersection of the domain of f and g. And the same thing's true for division, but we also have to remember that g of x cannot be zero, so you'll have to exclude those values. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Okay, consider the graph below. Okay, so for part one, they just want us to find uh, f plus g of negative two. So you know the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put the negative two with both. That's really f of negative two plus g of negative two. Now we could use the functions like we were before. You know, we could say, hey, I'm going to take negative two and I'm going to substitute it in here. And hey, I'm going to take negative two and I'm going to substitute it in here. But I'm going to kind of make you think differently because I want you to be flexible. Remember the notation f of x equals y. So the inside value is always x, and it equals the y value, right? So we know that the, the x value is negative 2. So I'm going to go to negative 2. Here's negative 1. Here's negative 2. So right here, right? And I'm going to look for the y value on the function f. Well, you can see that f is the orange line right here. Okay, so at negative two, I need to go to the orange line. Well, I would go down one space. Down one is the y value, okay? So I'm gonna put a negative one here. If I do the same thing for g of negative two, so I go to negative two, but now I go to the function g, which is this gray one, right, right here. If I look for the y value at negative two, it looks like I'm going up one plus one, okay? So this is going to be plus one. So the answer should be zero. Now you could get those values in the same way that we talked about, right? Okay, let me just kind of put some stuff here for your notes that I think would be helpful. So for F, 
from negative two, we went down one. But then for g of negative two, we went up one. Okay. All right, you could plug these values in. What happens if we substitute a negative two in? What's negative two plus one? What's negative one? Bam. Okay. Then if we do the same thing for g and we plug the negative two in here, the square root of negative two plus three is the square root of one, and there's your one. Now it's up to you. I feel like it's quicker from the graph because I'm not doing a bunch of math. All I'm doing is looking for the y value. So um, take your pick as for what you think would be easiest. Okay, I probably know both though because sometimes they don't give you the function. All right, I'm gonna box it. That's the answer to the first one. All right, let's go ahead and do f of one plus g of one. So the one actually goes with both, right? All right, f of one. So let's see, x is one, you guys. So that's going to be right here, OK? So I'm going to go to the function f, which again is the orange one. So let's see, one, two, it looks like. So we're going to put a two in for the answer for that one. All right, let's go to g. So G just so happens to also be at the same spot. The gray and the orange actually intersect. So that's going to be a two also. Two plus two gets you four. So there's your answer for that one. Now, can you find F plus G of negative four? Well, let's see if we can. That would really mean F of negative four plus G of negative four. And what would happen if we went to negative four is f we can find, right? f would be down one, down two, down three. So it would be negative three, right? Not running into any obstacles yet. But when we go to find g of negative four, the gray graph does not exist at negative four, right? Here's g right here. It's the square root function. And it's not defined over there. So this would just be not defined. So we can't do it. So can you find f plus g of negative four? No, okay? And that's because g is not defined for that value, okay? No, since g is not defined for x equals negative four. In other words, it's not in its domain, okay? All right, so find the domain of f, find the domain of g, and find the domain of f plus g. That's when we're going to use this last slide, where we're just going to find the intersection of the two. OK, so let's do f first. OK, so I'm going to make a number line for each one of these guys, OK? This will be for f, this will be for g, and this will be for f plus g. F, G, F plus G. Okay. All right, so let's talk about F. We'll talk about each one of these individually. I'm going to type in a bunch of stuff here because I don't know, you know, if you've been following the videos the whole time or if you just joined us for this video. And plus, everybody could use a reminder, okay? Um, since f is linear, so remember f of x is x plus 1. So how you want to think about it is there's no fraction. There's no variable in the denominator, in other words. And 2, there is no square root, right? I put there is not square root. There's no square root. So far in this class, those are the only functions that are going to give us a problem, that are going to give us a domain restriction. We might, we're going to learn more functions as we go along, like let's say logarithms, okay? But we haven't talked about logs yet. So the only functions that would give us domain restrictions are rational functions, aka fractions, or radicals where it's like an even index radical. So I could even put in here to make it more specific, any even index radical. Um, okay, 
The odds don't matter. It's all about evens, okay? There. Okay. So because there's none of those, right, then that means there are no domain restrictions. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the domain is going to be from negative infinity to infinity, any number you feel like. That's for f. Okay. So in other words, we would shade the entire thing. Let's put a zero on there. Okay. Everything shaded. All right. For g, now g does have some issues. For g, it is. I'm trying to think if I can. I think I'm gonna have to get a new box. Yeah. G of X is a root, huh? So that's a problem. I'm just gonna write the root in later, you guys. Um, okay, there is an even index root. So remember, uh, the radicand stuff inside cannot be negative, okay? All right. Let me put a square root on this guy really fast. Okay. So what that means is x plus 3 has to be greater than or equal to 0. That way we're square rooting a positive. That way we're getting something that's not imaginary, right? So if we move the 3 over, if we subtract the 3 from both sides, we get that x has to be greater than or equal to negative 3. All right, so let's say negative three is like right here. We've got to make sure that we go this way. And we're going to square bracket it because it's an or equal to, right? And just check. You'll know if you're right or not. You know, take something that's over here, like a negative four, and see what happens. If you were to plug a negative four into this function, okay, let's do that. Well, we end up square rooting a negative. That's imaginary, right? And so we know that we did a good job finding the domain that we can only do numbers, you know, negative three and up. Negative three works. We included it. We put a square bracket on it. Let's check. Negative three plus three under a root. Is that okay? Yeah, we can square root zero. It's going to be zero. So that's fine, right? Negative two would work too. Negative two plus three. Well, that's one, the square root of one is one. Okay, so we ended up getting the right domain, you guys. This looks perfect, okay? And we've shaded them. Now, to find F plus G, it's the intersection, right? That means it's going to be where you're double shaded or it's the overlap, okay? So let me go ahead and shrink this down because there's gonna be a lot that we're gonna type here. To find the domain of F plus G, it is the intersection of the two. In other words, numbers that are shaded on both. Okay. All right. So if we're looking for where we're shaded on both, well, that's simply going to be from, maybe I should do right blue. That's just going to be from negative three all the way this way. Those are the numbers that are shaded for both graphs, right? Okay. All right. So then the domain for F plus G to answer the question for part uh, C, I think we already answered it for F. For G, we didn't write it out with interval notation. So if we're from negative three and up, right, we'd be this way. Then it's going to be bracket negative three all the way to infinity. So let's box that. And now for F plus G, I think I'll just write it right here. Running out of space on this slide, huh? Um, its domain is going to be, well, we said this. So the same thing as G. Okay, so those are our three. We got the domain of F, which it wanted. We got the domain of G, which it wanted. 
and we got the domain of f plus g. All right. Don't worry, we'll get some more examples where we can practice, okay? All right, evaluate and write the domain and interval notation. Okay, so write out what this really means. This means r of x minus t of x. r of x is given to us in the directions. It's x squared plus 3. Don't forget parentheses right here. This is where a lot of students miss this. So this is worth me writing a note. Don't forget to wrap. I'll just put don't forget the parentheses. That's subtracting, right? Don't forget the parentheses. I'm subtracting. Oops. Okay. All right, so we distribute this negative sign in and we've got x squared minus 3 minus x take away 4. That's why those parentheses are so important. It changes the sign on the 4. All right, I'm going to go from highest exponent to lowest. So I'm going to do my x squared, then my x to the first, and then negative 3 take away 4 is negative 7. And again, stop. Don't try to solve it or anything. That's your answer right there. Now, it does want the domain, right, of... Um, the final answer, it says write the domain and interval notation. All right, so let's go in here and get the domain of all three of these guys individually. All right. All right, so we need the domain of, what do we have? R and T, R, T, and then the domain of R minus T. All right, well, I'm looking at R. It doesn't have a fraction. It doesn't have a radical. Negative infinity to infinity. Okay. Well, I'm looking at T. T doesn't have a fraction. T doesn't have a radical. So it too is going to be negative infinity to infinity. No domain restrictions. So the intersection of the two, in other words, the numbers that have been shaded on both, negative infinity to infinity, guys. So there are no domain restrictions for r minus t. So let's write that down. Domain is going to be negative infinity to infinity. Any number you feel like substituting in will work. All right, let's find r of t divided by t, I'm sorry, r of x divided by t of x. That's going to be how we write it out the long way. The x goes with both. All right, well, r of x, x squared plus 3. t of x is x plus 4. So there's the answer to the first part. Okay, now let's talk domain. So over here. All right. All right, you guys. So for R, T, and then R divided by T. All right, well, we already said that R was negative infinity to infinity because it had no um, fractions or radicals. We already said that t was negative infinity to infinity because it had no fractions or radicals. However, division is tricky. I'm not just going to take the intersection of the two. It says down here, the domain of f divided by g is also the intersections of the domains of f and g with the exclusion of any x values for which g of x equals 0. Notice g is the one on the bottom, you guys. So. We're going to have to ex look at the denominator. We're going to have to take the denominator, which is x plus 4. We're going to see set it equal to 0 and solve. x cannot be negative 4. Think about it. If you plugged a negative 4 in, negative 4 plus 4 would get us a 0 in the denominator, which is totally not allowed. So on our number line, negative 4 cannot be used but everything this way can, 
and everything that way can. So the way that we would write that out is we would say that the domain is going to be from negative infinity up to negative four, not included. That's going to describe that piece. And then from negative four to infinity, which will describe that piece. And that's going to be our domain of R divided by two. Yeah. All right. Multiplication. So remember, x goes with both. So this is really s of x times t of x. So we're going to substitute in s of x, which is 2 over x. And we're going to multiply that by t of x, which is x plus 4. Now we are going to clean this up. We are going to put the x plus 4 over 1 so we can multiply straight across, right? The 2 is going to hit the x. And the two is going to get the four, so eight. And then x times one just gets us x. So this would be our answer for the first part. But now we got to get the domain, right? So let's go ahead and get the domain. OK, we have s, we have t, and then s multiplied by t, right? OK. All right, S, we haven't done yet. But we can tell that for this one, X cannot be zero. If we plugged a zero in, we would be dividing by zero. So we'd have to go to where zero is, remove it, but then go ahead and shade everything to the left of it and everything to the right of it. So its domain, if I'm looking at this piece right here, would be negative infinity to zero. And then if I'm looking at this piece right here, 0 to infinity. Again, parentheses, because we can't include 0. All right, t has no fractions and no radicals. So negative infinity to infinity. Now, s times t is going to be values that belong to both. Okay. So I would go ahead and shade in all of these. These belong to both. But at zero, it doesn't belong to both. So I'm going to have to remove it. And then everything over here belongs to both graphs. So the domain for s times t would be negative infinity to zero union zero to infinity. OK. All right. So now we're looking at, again, you guys are doing calculus. Boy, this is week one of calculus one, and this is such a big deal. This is how we get all of our derivatives in calculus. You guys aren't adding the limit piece to it, but you're doing the most difficult part, uh, which is evaluating the difference quotient. Okay, so I'll take a little bit of time to explain uh, where this formula comes from, and then we'll go ahead and dive in and find and do some problems. The hardest part, honestly, is the f of x part. And guys, it's got to be hard because I could tell you right now, my calculus students struggle with it. So if you're in college algebra, it's definitely going to be hard because it's your first time seeing it. Okay, so I'll go nice and slowly. But first, let me just explain the notation, okay? So what's happening is you've got some sort of graph, right? And on the graph, we know two points. And this we know the secant line between the two points. So just a little vocab, a secant line passes through the curve versus a tangent line, oops, a tangent line touches the curve in one spot in that neighborhood right there, okay? That's the difference. Okay, so we're looking at a secant line because it touches twice. And the two spots where it touch or touches are going to be x and f of x. This is gonna be like our first point, okay? So in other words, this would be x down here. And this would be f of x right here. All right, and then we're going to go a little bit further. So how do we say a little bit further? We say x plus some, x plus some more. So that plus some more is the plus h part, right? OK, so that's going to be the x value. And then the y value associated with that x value would just be f of x plus h. So this is going to be the point x plus h, f of x plus h. So they're pretty ugly looking ordered pairs, right? 
ugly ordered pairs, especially this guy. That's an ugly looking ordered pair. But hopefully you just get that the notation is saying, okay, here's X. And how do I show I'm a little bit further along? X plus some. Okay. All right. Now what we're doing is we're essentially finding the slope. That's all we're doing. We know from earlier in the class that slope is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, okay? And now when we have these two points that we're looking at, this would be my x1 and my y1, and this would be my x2 and my y2. So we're just gonna substitute those in. If we do that, we got y2 minus y1, over x2, which is x plus h, minus x1, which is just x. My writing's kind of sloppy. That's not an x1, that's an x comma. Now, there are some things that can cancel. Hopefully, you can see that some things can cancel, like, for example, positive x and negative x. So if we do that, what remains is just f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And what you know? That is the formula here. So the way that you want to think about this formula is, oh, we just found the slope between two points. That's it. Okay. And this is called the difference quotient. Difference means subtraction. We are subtracting. And quotient means dividing. We are dividing. So that's why they called it the difference quotient. All right. So now we're going to find the difference quotient for uh, example four and example five. We'll start off with an easy one here, a nice linear one, and then we'll move into the more difficult one where we have a, a quadratic, okay? Now, the way that I'm gonna work this is we're gonna first just find f of x plus h since that's the hardest part, okay? So first, let's find Oh my gosh, you guys, one of those days, okay. First, let's find f of x plus h, since that's the hardest part. All right, so that means plug in x plus h. Plug in, boy, where'd my g go? Plug in x plus h, oh, I don't want that divided, into all x's. Okay, all right, so we're gonna go ahead and substitute x plus h so so we're going to take x plus h and we're going to substitute it in right there but then don't forget minus two right so we'll distribute the five that's it so that's the first part that's what f of x plus h is there's so much in here in the directions that students are like, oh, where do I plug what in? Remember, whatever is inside the parentheses replaces X. So this X won't be here anymore. This is gonna be X plus H now. If it had been the number three, maybe not so abstract, it had been the number three, most students could have seen, oh, I'm just gonna plug a three in. But for some reason, when the X plus H is there, it feels weird to plug an X in for an X. And so I get it. All right. Now let's go ahead and go in and get the difference quotient. It'll be easier now that we have the f of x plus h piece. So here's the difference quotient. You know me, I always recommend writing things down, they ground you, and then you memorize them without even trying, okay? All right, so f of x plus h, hey, we got it. That's what we just worked on. So I'm just gonna copy it down. Minus parentheses, we said anytime you're subtracting, don't forget the parentheses. Second time today we talked about it. All right, and then we're going to substitute in f of x. Well, hey, f of x is in the directions. We don't even have to work for that guy at all. So f of x plus h does the hard part. Now, in this class, I should probably shrink this down a little bit so I can fit this in here. In this class, the h's will always cancel. So if the H does not cancel, you've made a mistake somewhere, okay? So that's going to be my little tip. Tip. In this class, the H in the denominator should cancel, okay? If it doesn't, 
check your map. Okay. All right. So I know this H should cancel. Let's see if it does. So we got 5x plus 5h minus 2 minus 5x plus 2. So 5x minus 5x is gone. Negative 2, positive 2 is gone. So all that remains is 5h over h. And check it out. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good, right? Okay. All right. So this is uh, it's tough notationally. It's not tough computationally, at least not this example. And just really focus on this f of x plus h. Make sure you say to yourself, do I know what that means that I need to do? And you test yourself over and over, okay? All right. So now we have another example. So let's go in and get f of x plus h. Now this one's gonna be kind of hard computationally. So we're gonna take the x plus h and we're gonna substitute it in for this x and for this x, you guys. It's gotta go in for both. So instead of x, x plus h. Instead of x, x plus h. Squaring means you gotta write it out twice. I'm going to distribute that negative 3. Why not? x squared. I always go alphabetically. Um, that way I can see my like terms better. So h comes before x in the alphabet. So I'm going to write hx. h comes before x. So I'm going to write hx again. And then h squared. All right, the only like terms that I'm seeing are the hx's. So hx plus hx is going to be 2hx. Just add the, the ones that are in front. Now you might be looking at this going, I messed up somewhere. No way is this the answer, but it's the answer. Okay, it's hideous, huh? I'm going to put the bar really close to this because we're going to need some space for the difference quotient. So remember, that's only one piece of the difference quotient, you guys. If you're planning on continuing on in the calculus, make sure that you're really trying to master this. That would be my advice for you. All right, f of x plus h. Minus parentheses, f of x now. Well, that's up here, so I'm just going to copy it. And remember, the h should cancel, huh? So let's see if that happens. going to change all the signs. We'll have a canceling fest here. Let's see, we got an x squared and an x squared that's gone. Let's see what else cancels, you guys. Oh, the negative 3x and the positive 3x. And the 8 and the negative 8. Okay, let's see what's survived here. We've got 2hx plus h squared and minus 3h. That's it. Now, the h in the denominator better cancel. Well, if we look at the numerator, everybody's got an h. I'm going to factor that h out of everybody in the top. And so that means that we can cancel the h's. That makes you feel like you might have done it right, right? Mecklenburg said the H's should all cancel. They did. That is a good sign. So we end up with 2x plus H minus 3 is our final answer. I will try to look for some 
videos that maybe do some more examples of these, because this is probably the one of the tougher things in this section. And um, put those up on the Canvas page for you guys, okay? All right. Example six, find the domain of <laughs> F, G, and F plus G. All right. Let me just check and see. Okay, yeah, we're almost done, you guys. Okay. All right, so find the domain of F. Well, we got a graph. That's going to be easy. So let's just go ahead and put here F. G, F plus G, okay. I'm looking at F. Remember domain means the X values. Okay, so domain equals the X values. Well, if I look at the X values for F, I am seeing from here all the way to here. So this would be from zero all the way to nine. So from zero all the way to nine. Now I'm gonna put a square bracket on the zero and the nine because these are closed circles at the end, which means it is on the graph, okay? All right, now I'm gonna look at G. If I look at G, maybe I'll just kind of do it right here and right here. There you go. You can see that G is sandwiched in between three and 10. So it's from three to 10. Now remember, F plus G is gonna be the intersection of the two. So in other words, where um, numbers that belong to both, right? And some of you probably don't need this, but I'm just gonna do it to be extra clear, okay? Just take a second. Okay, so we got zero through nine, 10. Same thing, oops, I should move these a little bit lower. Oops. Okay. Okay, this will be F, this will be G, this will be F plus G. Okay, so we know that F is from, what do you say, zero to nine. So I would shade in zero to nine square brackets. We know that G is from three to 10 square brackets. So if we look at the numbers that belong to both, right? We look for the intersection the overlap. This region right here does not belong to both. It actually only belongs to F, so I'm not going to shade it. But this region right here does belong to both, so I'll go ahead and shade that. This region right here does not belong to both. It does belong to G, but it doesn't belong to F, so I'm not going to shade that. Three belongs to both because it's definitely shaded here and it's square bracketed here. And then nine belongs to both because it's shaded here and it's square bracketed here. So I'm going to include the three and the nine. So for the domain for F plus G, it'd be bracket three, bracket nine. All right. Find the domain of F minus G, F times G, and F divided by G. Well, it's gonna be the same for F minus G and F times G. Okay, so F minus G and F times G, will have the same domain as F plus G. Okay. So the answer for the first part is just going to be three to nine again, right? Okay, so three to nine. But now we got to talk about F divided by G. F divided by G will have the same also. F divided by G will have, uh, well, I don't know, how, it's not gonna be the same. We'll have uh, almost the same, right? 
we just need to make sure, or we just need to exclude any values of x that make g of x equal zero. Now, why g of x? Because g of x is the one in the denominator. If the f of x had been the one in the denominator, then we would be excluding values where f of x equals zero. Remember, we can't have zeros in the denominator. We can't have zeros in the denominator of a fraction. Denominator of a fraction. Okay, so if we go up here and we look where g of x equals zero, g of x never equals zero because it does not touch the x-axis, okay? So I'm gonna just put here, luckily, g of x never equals zero since it never touches the x-axis. So there are no domain restrictions. So it's also going to be three to nine. Okay. All right, now we're kind of gonna have the same question, but this time instead of F over G, it's G over F. So G divided by F will almost have the same domain, right? as f plus g. We just need to exclude any x values that make f of x equal 0. All right, well, there are spots where f of x equals 0. Let's highlight them. Right here and right here, Okay, so this is six, and then this is eight, right? F of six is zero. F of eight is zero. So we're gonna have to exclude six and eight, okay? So we need to exclude six and eight. Okay, so if I'm looking at a number line, here's what we have, right? We said that the domain is gonna be from three to nine, right? Three to nine, there's three, there's nine, but six is also excluded and eight is also excluded. So this is what the shading looks like. It's like, okay, all these are good, all these are good and all these, okay? All right, so if we were to write that out, the domain, it would be from bracket three all the way to six parentheses. We don't wanna include six. That's gonna explain this piece. Then parentheses six to eight, we don't wanna include six or eight. And then parentheses eight to nine bracket. Remember, if you put parentheses on something, you're saying don't include it. And we definitely do not want to include six and eight because it will make the denominator zero. All right, so we did it by picture instead of by equation. Kind of feels funky. All right, draw F plus G. Okay. So I'm just gonna make a little T chart for this one. Let me just kind of look at my notes and see what I, as I decided here. So this is the x value, this is going to be f, this is going to be g, and this is going to be f plus g. Now remember we said that the domain was from 3 to 9. I'm going to pick 
two, just so you guys can see why that's a problem. If we go to the graph and we look at two, f of two, well, it looks like it's about 1.75. I'm just going to estimate, okay? We'll put approximately 1.75. But if we go to find g of two, g is the blue graph. When I'm at x equals two, there's no blue graph. So this is actually undefined. Okay, which means that this would be undefined. And the reason why we got that is we picked somebody outside of the domain, right? We should only be picking values inside the domain. So I'm gonna pick three. Um, we'll just pick four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, okay? All right, now at three, some of these I'm just estimating, you guys bear with me, but F of three, so here's three, I'm gonna go up one, two, it looks like for F. Oops, so this is gonna be two. If we do it for G, G is going to just be at, at three, it's just gonna be up one, it's the blue graph. All right, so two plus one, two plus one, it says three. Okay, so this is the ordered pair. Three, three, you guys. I'm gonna graph them. Over three, up three, bam, there we are. All right, for four. When x equals four to get to uh, the red graph or to get to f, we went up one, let's say 1.75 because it's not quite two. Again, this is me estimating. All right, to get to the green when I'm at four, or the blue, one, it's the same spot, huh? They intersect there. So 1.75 again. 1.75 is 1.75. It's going to be around 3.5. So this would be the ordered pair, 4, 3.5. So I'm going to go over 4 and up 3.5. There. All right, when x is 5. For F, we only went up one. For G, we went up one, two, three, you guys. So one plus three, it's this four. So this is gonna be the point five comma four. So I'm gonna go over five on the X and up four. Okay. All right. Six. Well, it's going to be zero. I didn't go up at all. And then to get to the the blue, one, two, three and a half. Let's just say three and a half, you guys. So zero plus three point five means we're going to get approximately three point five. So six comma. Oops. 3.5-ish, maybe look right there. Okay. All right, at seven, we actually went down one to get to the red graph, so negative one. And then at seven, we went up one, two, three, four to get to G. So negative one plus four gets us three. So this is the ordered pair, seven, three. Okay, at eight, it's zero for the function f, and then it's up one, two, three for the function g. So zero plus three is three. So eight, three. Okay. All right, and then our last one that we're gonna do it for is just nine, right? Okay, all right. So at nine, it looks like we went up one. And then um, we went up one, two. Now there's a lot of faking going on here. I'm not gonna lie, I'm about to fake this right now. The only reason we're doing this is we wanted you to see like how we actually go about, you know getting the graphs of these. We do more points than this, so I won't have to fake as much normally, right? Okay. Oops, I didn't do this one. Okay. So it looks to me, and this is me faking, 
it looks like it's going to be something like, let me change the color. Something like that. Okay, now don't put arrows. Resist the temptation to arrow the end. I have to like fight the temptation myself. I'm so used to putting arrows. Because remember, it does not go beyond nine and it does not go beyond three. It's undefined for these values um, because these weren't arrowed up here, right? And they we have domain restrictions here, okay? So this is gonna be our function, f plus g, at least my best guess at it. Okay, I'd have to do more values to find out all the in-betweeners and stuff. Like, does this really stay aligned? I did try a few fractional ones and it was still giving me three, you guys. So that's why I decided to make it a flat line. I actually did it for like 7.5 and up here. And I was like, oh, it looks like it is going to be a flat line. Okay. G minus F. So we could basically take those same values. So I kind of want to go back and like copy it. So let me do this. Oops. That's not what I meant to do, but all right, let's see here. Control C. This guy back. And then we'll just delete what we don't need, which we obviously don't want this stuff. All right. So if we're going to do G minus F, right? This is, of course, still going to be undefined. All right, G minus F. So one minus two. So that's gonna get us the point three, negative one. Okay, let's just pretend this is negative one. All right. And then this one would be 1.75 minus 1.75, which would get us zero. So this would be four comma zero. 3 minus 1 gets us 2, so 5, 2. So this would be 6, 3.5. All right. 4 minus negative 1 is 5. Minus a negative means add. So this would be seven, five. And then three minus zero is three, eight, three. And then two minus one is one, so nine, one. Okay, so it looks like something like this. Oops, I'm terrible about actually hitting the dots. There we go. Okay. All right. And remember, no arrows. So I had to fight it again. I wanted to arrow it, you guys. It's only going to be defined between three and nine. All right. So time consuming. Do I think that it's like really mind blowing? No, it's just kind of time consuming. You got to be neat, not make little errors on these last two. If I could focus on like what I think are like the tough pieces. Finding this difference quotient, I would definitely put some time into that. And then making sure that I understand what was in this box right here, that this, I get this, and that I understand that it's going to be the intersection of the two pretty much for most of them. Just when dividing, I got to make sure I exclude any values that make the bottom zero. I feel like that's the meat of this section. Well, and of course, understanding that first slide, that X goes with both knowing how to rewrite these with the X with both, you know, et cetera. That's really going to help you if you can get this first step done, right? Taking it from this to this, because then it's usually just a matter of substituting in from that point. Okay. All right, you guys, like I said, I'm going to try to look for some more practice, uh, like worksheets maybe, and also maybe some more videos for that difference quotient, and maybe the domain too. Otherwise, take care, you guys. Thanks for joining me.